Tonight's program, we're excited about um, joining us. We have historian Edward Melillo, and he is the author of The Butterfly Effect, Insects and, making the, and the Making of the Modern World. Um, I like Publishers Weekly rave that Melillo's fa fascinating survey makes a persuasive argument that some of the world's smallest animals are also bottomless reservoirs of possibility. <laughs> and that's pretty much what your book is all about. <laughs> Um, Dr. Melillo is a professor of history and environmental studies at Amherst College in Massachusetts. He is the author of Strangers on Familiar Soil, Rediscovering the Chile-California Connection, which won the Western History Association's 2016 Cowie Prize for the most distinguished book on the American West. He was awarded the Mellon New Directions Fellowship in 2017 he received his PhD and his MPhil from Yale University. If you're interested in purchasing copies of The Butterfly Effect, our local bookshop in town, The Learned Owl, um, has copies available for purchase. And my colleague will put the link in the chat box if you would like to purchase one of, um, one of the books for this evening. If you have any questions during the program, we would welcome your questions. Go ahead and put those in the Q&A box and we'll, um, we'll get started and hear what Dr. Melillo has to share with us tonight. And then we will try to address any questions afterwards. So thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Melillo. Thank you so much, Allison, for that lovely introduction. And thanks also to the Hudson Library and Historical Society for hosting me tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I'll start a brief presentation. And after I talk for about 25 minutes, I'll be happy to open it up to questions and hear what you think. Okay, Let's see, there we go. I hope everyone can see that. So I'm gonna be talking tonight about a book of mine that was published in August by Penguin Random House called The Butterfly Effect, Insects and the Making of the Modern World. And I'm gonna start out uh, with the basics and just give us a reminder of what are insects. Insects are a class of organisms, they're animals. Uh, they all have several features in common. They have a tripartite body featuring a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. By the way, this beautiful drawing was done for me by a Hawaii-based artist, Kirsten Carlson. This is of a monarch butterfly, but it shows you the anatomy of an insect. They all have six legs, a pair of antenna on their head, and uh, two pairs of wings, four wings and hind wings. And they all have somewhat translucent exoskeletons. So th that's the insect body plan and it gives you a sense of insect anatomy. I wanna talk a little bit about insects in world history. They've got a jump on us. Insects evolved approximately 480 million years ago, just for, for relative comparison, the earth is about 4.5 billion years old and the oldest ancestors of humans, the um, oldest skeleton evidence of that in the fossil record date back to now we think 300,000 years uh, based on evidence found in Morocco. The largest insects to have ruled Earth's prehistoric skies, and there's a fossil of one shown in the picture here, were enormous dragonfly-like dragonfly bugs known as griffin flies. And these things must have been intimidating in prehistoric skies with their big jaws and enormous wingspans. They were about the size of small hawks with two to three foot wingspans. Uh, and these things flourished about 300 million years ago. In many ways, humans are guests on an insect planet. They not only have uh, outdated us in terms of how far back they go in, in the Earth's history, but there are many, many more of them than us on the planet. Entomologists now estimate that there are 10 quintillion individual insects alive at any moment. That's 10 followed by 18 zeros, a number that greatly intrigues my seven-year-old son. We've tried writing this out on paper together. Uh, in recent years, scientists have accepted an estimate of about 5.5 million insect species. I'll talk a bit more about that if I have a chance later. The beetles are the most numerous of those. Uh, and insects occur everywhere on the planet. This is the vacu bug, 
which is a flightless bug that inhabits the summit area of a mountain that's been in the news quite a bit in recent months, Mauna Kea, which is over 12,800 feet in Hawaii on Hawaii Island, the big island of Hawaii. And it dines on fragments of other creatures that are blown to their icy deaths on the almost permanently frozen summit. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have the Sahara Desert Ant, which can, can sustain body temperatures of well above 122 degrees Fahrenheit in a place where surface temperatures reach upwards of 178 degrees Fahrenheit. Other than the oceans, insects are everywhere on this planet. And there are even a few that are capable of, of inhabiting uh, the world's oceans. This may be the view that many of us still have of insects. This is a December 3rd, 1930 issue of Modern Mechanics magazine, Will Monster Insects Rule the World? And for good reason, we associate insects with plagues like Zika, malaria, dengue, fever. Insects have been the scourge of humanity throughout much of world history. And there has been much ink spilled in that direction, looking at the awful impacts insects have had on human history. But I decided to write a book that tells a different story. As I was doing the research for this project, I found enormous amounts of evidence that insects have had tremendously beneficial interactions with humans throughout the past. And that's what I focus on here. I want to start kind of curiously with three people and three objects. The first of which you may recognize is Ella Fitzgerald, America's first lady of song. The second, and this may seem incongruous as a trio to you at first, is the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Mesud I in the 19th century. And the third image is of Brigadier General Charles O'Hara surrendering Lord Cornwallis's sword at Yorktown, Virginia in 1781. And then associated with those three individuals are three objects. In 1944, Ella Fitzgerald's record uh, released by DECA featured a hit song into which life some rain must fall, which spent a number of weeks at the top of the billboard charts. The second object I'll introduce is Abdul Mesud I's many carpets uh, from his palace, Dombachi Palace uh, on the Bosphorus. And then the third is Brigadier Charles O'Hara's coat. Now what unites this incongruous trio of individuals and objects is that the objects are all made from secretions of insects. The shellac record on which Ella Fitzgerald hit songs were impressed, the Ottoman Sultan's silk carpets, and the Brigadier General's jacket dyed with a bug that I will talk about later called cochineal were all the product of insects and their human associates in world history. I'll talk about these three insects right here. Up in the upper left-hand corner, I've got the cochineal bug, and it actually is a true bug. Um, sometimes in the United States, we use bug to mean all insects. True bugs have sucking, biting mouthpieces and special wings, and some of the insects I'll talk about tonight are truly bugs, according to entomologists. Then I'm showing you Bombyx mori, the silkworm, in the upper right-hand corner. And the third insect I'll be talking about is the cochineal bug. It is also a true bug. And it's the source of the great red dye that was much sought after in Europe from the 16th to 19th centuries and has made a real resurgence today. So I'll start with shellac and talk a little bit about the shellac insect and this product that it produces that has been so sought after in the past and is once again experiencing a resurgence like all three of these insect products. The shellac bug, which is raised on fig and acacia trees in India, Thailand, Myanmar or Burma and other parts of Southeast Asia, also in, so excuse me, in Southern China, uh, secretes this resinous substance shown here on an acacia branch. That substance is subsequently harvested by men and women it's melted into bath towel sized sheets and then broken into fragments and exported in this form. And then it's turned into a host of products. One of them, as I found out, was the 78 RPM record. 
the longest lasting of the audio technologies so far. From the late 19th century until the 1940s, this was the means for the global transmission of recorded sound. You may remember, or you may remember from your grandparents' house, depending on your age, the sound of these 70 R 78 RPMs. They're, they sound a lot like like bacon sizzling in a frying pan when you listen to jazz, blues, and old classical music on these 78 RPMs. But the major constituent component of these records is an insect secretion, shellac. Shellac was also found in these beautiful objects, daguerreotype cases, the cases that enclosed the first generation of photographic technologies that were one of a kind prints on copper plates taken starting in the 1830s into the beginning of the 20th century. They were very fragile and needed to be protected. And so shellac was used as a precursor to plastic to make a host of beautiful cases that often were engraved or pressed into various designs that had all sorts of, of uh, themes from Greek mythology to revolutionary war iconography, you name it. Today though, Shellac, like the other two products, silk and cochineal that I'll be talking about, has experienced a major resurgence. You may know it as the product you varnish your furniture or your back porch with. Here's some Zinsser bullseye shellac, but it's in absolutely everything. I don't know if your kids were able to do pandemic trick-or-treating, but if they were, they were probably eating shellac. It's in almost all candy as a coating to waterproof the candy to prevent it from losing moisture and to give it its shine. And shellac masquerades under the pseudonym confectioner's glaze in much candy. But it's also in all sorts of everyday products, making it ubiquitous in our daily lives. When you walk into a grocery store, the shiny fruits you're seeing in the fruit aisle are often coated in shellac, especially apples are, to give them that sheen and to keep the moisture in, making them look plump and fresh. Much nail polish has shellac in it. And to the chagrin of my hairdresser prior to the pandemic, uh, we looked at all of the products on her shelf and most hairspray indeed contains shellac. Shellac is in dental fillings. It's used in embalming as a substitute for formaldehyde. And it's almost everywhere in your daily lives. You're probably eating it unbeknownst to you. Uh, and then here are two women, one on the left in India and one on the right in Myanmar, Burma, harvesting shellac from fig and acacia trees. I want to talk next briefly about silk, which is similar to shellac in that human cultivators in close relationship with plants have been raising this insect for thousands of years for what this insect secretes. In this case, it's silk. Sericulture is simply the fancy name that people use for talking about raising the silkworm. Technically, it's not a worm, it's a caterpillar. I'll tell you more about that later. But when you raise silkworms, uh, this is how it's often done in bamboo baskets on a bed of mulberry leaves, in this case in China. Uh, and here are the white mulberry plants on which silkworms dine. You end up at the end of the silkworm's life cycle with this remarkable looking creature, the silk moth, which is blind and flightless. If it's allowed to emerge from its cocoon, and often it's not because sericulturalists generally dip their cocoons in boiling water to then reel the silk thread out, thus killing the pupa. But if it's allowed to emerge, it looks like this. It mates and then dies after about three days of life. But it's a fascinating looking creature at every stage of its life. And uh, here is a silkworm having spun its cocoon. It makes a little sort of teepee-like nest uh, spins its cocoon and then spends a few weeks transforming through metamorphosis inside that cocoon. And then if it emerges as a moth, it looks like what I showed you in the previous slide. But if not, the silk is then reeled uh, to make something that we all know as a quite precious constituent of many fabrics. Here are silkworm cocoons in a man's hand, and then an image of men reeling silk in Turkestan in the 19th century. And you can see the man on the left is using a reeling device, taking the thread from the man on the right who's dipped the cocoons in a pot of boiling water. Contemporary silk production looks a lot like it has for about 3,000 years in China. These are women producing silk in Sichuan province. And you can see the cocoons right in front of them um, and the reeling machines uh, in the foreground. 
And then a woman with some rug shown in Avanos, Turkey, similar shot of, of silkworm cocoons in front of her and reeling machines there as well. I'll tell you a little story about the history of silk and the Western encounter with a product that was largely produced throughout Asia for most of its history. The Chinese had a virtual monopoly on silk production until this moment. This is the first encounter by Westerners with silk. It occurred in 53 BCE when Rome's wealthiest man, Marcus Licinius Crassus, marched his seven Roman legions into battle against the Parthians of modern day Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. I'm showing you an image, a map here that locates Karhe for you. And in this battle, you've got to imagine this for a second. I'll set the scene for you here. It's a desert, uh, the sun is hot, there are dunes, and the Parthian standard bearers march over those dunes, carrying some 30 to 60 gigantic, 30 to 40 foot red silk banners. The Romans had never seen silk and were just astounded when the Parthians unfurled these banners, which were embossed with golden thread. And apparently, the Roman legionaries were so paralyzed by the sight that they stood still for a moment and the great Parthian archers pinned them to the ground or to their shields with a hail of arrows. This is remarked on both in Plutarch and by Pliny. You can see in the lower left-hand side an image of a Parthian archer. Uh, this is actually the origin of the sardonic expression to take a parting shot. The Parthians were able to fire arrows by turning 180 degrees, aiming and launching their arrows while their horses were retreating. So when you take a parting shot at someone, you're actually referring to a battle in 53 BCE. But in the book, I frame this as a human encounter with an insect secretion because it was the first time that the Romans had ever seen silk and they were in complete awe. And from then on, they did everything they possibly could to get their hands on this silk fabric. Moving on now to the third and final insect of my trio, I'll tell you a bit about cochineal, which may be the least familiar to you. If you're thinking of how to pronounce this, the mnemonic device I often give my students is, can you coach an eel? It's very hard to coach eels, of course, because they're wriggling about, but that's how you pronounce cochineal. Uh, cochineal, is an insect that's often raised in Mexico and now in Highland, Peru. And the female insect uses her proboscis and sucks sweet juices out of the cladodes or the pads of nopal cacti. And so when people raise cochineal bugs, they do so in small straw baskets on the side of nopal cacti pads, which you're seeing here. And then I'll show you an image of what a dried cochineal insect looks like. And after the presentation, uh, you may be able to see me, but I'll show you what a bottle of cochineal insects looks like as well. Um, the female secretes this red pigment to protect her young from predators. It's poisonous, but as it turns out, it's got tremendous dyeing properties and also incredible fixative properties. It's a dye that does not run easily, and when combined with various metals called mordants, it can produce a range of hues from deep Corinthian purple blues to light pinks. Peru's Paracas culture dating back to 700 to 300 BCE uh, were the originators of raising cochineal for this red dye. And then it seems to have passed northwards probably by ship in early trade between what is now Peru and Mesoamerica and the Mexican parts of, of, of the continent. Uh, and you can see this beautiful Peruvian Paracas cloth shown here with cochineal dye. In the accounts we have of Montezuma that come often from Spanish friars who were recording their thoughts about their encounter with peoples in the Americas, we have records of Montezuma taking tribute in the forms of bags of cochineal, which are in the center of the image here. Um, and the Codex Mendoza has multiple images that contain bags of cochineal. Once the Europeans figured out that this product had uh, the power to create these deep red and scarlet hues, they did everything they could to get their hands on this product raised by indigenous peoples in the Americas. Ecclesiastical vestments, military outfits, 
latest fashion statements were all uh, desirous of having this red hue. And so cochineal was the second most lucrative traded product in the Spanish empire after only silver. It takes about 70,000 crushed female bodies of the cochineal insect to make a one pound brick of dried cochineal dye. So you can imagine that producing this stuff in almost assembly line fashion um, became the raison d'etre of a number of the colonies throughout the Americas for the Spanish. And here I'm showing you various hues that you can achieve with cochineal by combining it with different metals. And then just an image of an indigenous man cultivating cochineal in what is now Mexico. He's brushing the cochineal insects off the nopal cacti pads using a deer's hair brush. And then on the right, you see the male and female insects. The males basically reproduce and then fly away. The females do all the, the crucial labor here, raising their young, and they're the source of this precious red dye. Today though, like shellac and like silk, cochineal has experienced a major resurgence. This is a picture of a cochineal farm, a plantation in Southern Mexico in Oaxaca. Bienvenidos, welcome to our cochineal farm. Pase usted, come in. And you can see on the right, a little cochineal insect with a top hat and a cane welcoming you in. And you can see people producing this red dye in much the same way as they have done for several thousand years. This is a woman in Oaxaca using a metate to release this carmine dye from the dried female cochineal insect bodies. Now cochineal, as it turns out, is probably something you've eaten, maybe unbeknownst to you, but it's in a host of everyday products. Starbucks had a major controversy on its hands when a number of food activists found out that they were dyeing their strawberry frappuccinos with cochineal. Eventually they abandoned that and started to use beet juice instead. But fruit on the bottom yogurt, fake crab legs at your favorite Japanese restaurant, a whole host of candies, cocktail products, Tropicana ruby red grapefruit juice, all get their red dye from cochineal. And you can find it in ingredients lists as carmine. I was giving a lecture at Emerson College one day and a bunch of my students walked in and they had apples and yogurts that they'd picked up for breakfast at the cafeteria. And I pointed out to them, uh, did they know that they were actually eating two insect secretions? They all looked down and we looked at the ingredients list on the yogurt and indeed carmine was there and there was shellac on the apple. So they were doing double duty on consuming insect products unbeknownst to themselves. Um, now you may be wondering why in the world did this trio of insect secretions experience such a dramatic resurgence after seemingly disappearing? Of course, shellac records were replaced by vinyl records in the early 1940s, and we began to see a whole bunch of synthetic plastics replacing many of the uses to which shellac had been put. The same is true of cochineal. There were a whole host of synthetic red dyes that emerged after World War II that seemed to have accomplished a complete substitution of synthetic products for these natural dyes. Um, and the same is also true of silk. Uh, things like rayon and, and, um, and polyethylene fibers looked like they'd completely replaced silk after the Second World War, uh, but they did not, as it turns out, over the long run, achieve the success that their promoters had thought. And the reason for that is twofold. One, during the 1970s, there was the rise of a new branch of science called environmental toxicology. And the scientists working in this field of inquiry began to recognize that many of these synthetic products that were claimed as in this particular ad referring to rubber to be the substitutes for nature turned out to be carcinogenic or toxic to the human body in other ways. The second reason is that engineers have never been able to figure out structurally significant analogs to a number of natural products. I focus on silk in the book, but one can think of milk and blood and rubber, as in this case, that have remained with us despite promoters saying they would be entirely obsolete by the beginning of the 21st century. Silk, as it turns out, really bedevils engineers. It's got the tensile strength of steel and the pliability of rubber. And they've never been able to figure out how to synthesize an analog that's inexpensive enough to be mass produced 
in a laboratory. So a lot of the claims about the Second World War ending our reliance upon natural, and I'm putting that in quotes, forms of production with laboratory produced substitutes turned out to not hold a lot of water. And so the rise of synthetic chemistry as it was proclaimed after the Second World War gave us many products that we continue to use today, but also has now left us once again reliant upon nature for many things that occur as ubiquitous elements of our daily lives. In the second half of the book, I talk about what I call the hives of modernity. These are places that we think of as resolutely modern, but that are inhabited by insect bodies at their very heart. As of 2018, there have been eight Nobel Prizes awarded to 18 different scientists for research involving this insect, Drosophila melanogaster, the common fruit fly. As it turns out, Drosophila has a genome that's very similar to the human genome and allows us to study genetics at a much bigger scale. They have really, really large chromosomes that can be seen under light microscopes. And this was a tremendous advantage when this science got going at the turn of the century. There were no scanning or transmission electron microscopes to be looking at tiny things. So all you had was organisms that you could see under the aperture of a light microscope and Drosophila fit that bill. And one of the pioneers in Drosophila research actually had a connection to my hometown, as it turns out. I grew up in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, a center for marine biological research. And Thomas Hunt Morgan, who was the first Nobel Prize winner for his genetic work on Drosophila, did all of his summer work at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. Uh, he also did his winter work at the fly room, as it was called, at Columbia University. And you can see in the back of this picture, there are bunches of semi-rotting bananas hanging from the back of the room. One reason that Drosophila is such a great model organism is that it reproduces quickly on a diet largely comprised of overripe fruit. So it's a dream scenario for scientists to be able to put these things in flasks and they reproduce very quickly in a matter of days, just eating overripe fruit. Now I owe a debt of gratitude as it turns out to Thomas Hunt Morgan's wife, who was in her own right a major entomologist, Lillian Sampson. She, he, she took Morgan's name, excuse me, later in life after they married, but Lillian founded the Woods Hole Children's School of Science. And as an 11 year old, I spent a summer in an entomology class at the Woods Hole Children's School of Science. And a wonderful monarch butterfly specialist there named Becky Lash introduced me to the world of insects. It was a hot afternoon. A bunch of us were very fidgety in the classroom. And Becky brought in a monarch butterfly on her finger and put it on a ripe wedge of watermelon. It inserted its proboscis into the fruit and began to take a long drink. And that was the first moment when I realized what I had in common with this species that had previously seemed so foreign to me. We were all thirsty, we were all hot, and all we wanted was a drink. So I owe a debt of gratitude to Thomas Hunt Morgan's wife. We also owe debts of gratitude to two other people whose stories I profile in the book who absolutely fascinated me. The woman on the left is Maria Sibylla Mirian. She was born in 1647 uh, in Prussia, and she ended up traveling from the Netherlands to Dutch Suriname, which was a very unusual thing for a woman to do. It was even more unusual to do it as she did in 1699 with her daughter Dorothea without any male accompaniment. She funded the entire journey herself by selling 425 paintings. And she went for purely scientific reasons. She went to study the organisms of Suriname and she and her daughter spent three years roving around Suriname, often taking dugout canoes from Paramaribo deep into the heart of the country and traipsing around the jungle, making paintings of everything they saw and what they were really after were insects. And Maria's paintings are marvelous. If you haven't had a chance to see them, they're on display in many galleries throughout the world, but you should really jump at the opportunity if you get a chance to see Marion's, Marion's watercolors of insects. They're remarkable. And she brought them back 
to Europe and then published a book two years later. She returned in 1701 and the book came out in 1703. That's the Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname. And in that book, she did two remarkable things. The first was she showed insects in their natural habitats. This doesn't seem all that revolutionary and remarkable to us now, but the trend in Europe had been to show insects bereft of any background. You may know Albrecht Dürer's The Stag Beetle from 1505. It's a beetle on a blank white background. And that set the standard for how illustrators uh, depicted organisms. Miriam bucked that trend by finally showing insects in the habitats in which they lived uh, and the ecosystems in which they existed. And this was remarkable to finally situate these organisms within the array of other organisms uh, that they depended upon. The other thing that Marion did that was really important is she showed in the space of a single image all the phases of an insect's life cycle, from egg to larva to pupa to adult. Previously, many people studying insects had thought that the different phases of an insect's life were actually different organisms. And so what Marion was able to show is the process of metamorphosis, and this revolutionized the study of entomology. The other person who really struck me when I was doing the research as having a remarkable story was the person to the right in this image, Charles Henry Turner. He was born in 1867 and led a life in a largely segregated country. He did remarkable work on honeybees and gave us much of the science that led us to understand pollination, which I'll talk about in a moment, but was hardly recognized because he was black and was unable to get a job at a major US university, even though he was the first African-American to get a PhD in zoology from the University of Chicago. And he was the first African-American published in the prestigious journal Science. But as I said, he was unable to get a university job and so did all of his research without, without graduate students, without laboratory equipment, and conducted some very elegant but simple experiments in parks in St. Louis. And all of his research eventually ended up finding its way into the hands of other entomologists who built upon it. And he left a real legacy in our understanding of how honeybees uh, know, come to know their world. I'll talk a little bit now about another chapter in the second half of the book where I look at the way that the future of food may depend upon insects as well. Uh, and that's entomophagy. It's the fancy term for eating insects. I've already talked about that a little in the context of the cochineal and shellac that appear in so many of our everyday foods. But uh, as it turns out, about 2 billion people on the planet at any, at any one time are eating insects. And there's a marvelous array of diverse ways in which that's done. I'll show you a few here. I've sampled a number of these. This is one of my favorites. These are chapulines. These are grasshoppers that are cooked on a flat hot plate called a comal. And they're seasoned with uh, sprinklings of chiles and, and a douse of lime. And they're very tasty. They're, they're crunchy and, and I find them quite yummy. They've taken off in the United States as it turns out at Safeco Field where the Seattle Mariners play, they've now served up a quarter million servings of Chapulines. There are several Mexican food stands in the stadium that sell them along traditional, alongside traditional ballpark fare. Uh, so you may begin to see alongside Franks and popcorn uh, Chapulines in, in various sports stadiums. Another one that you may know less about here is the Mopane worm known as Mopanis that are a major source of protein throughout many Southern African countries. Um, and they're absolutely crucial. One of the reasons that they're so important is that they can be dried and preserved without refrigeration. And so in places where electricity is short, you've got a major protein source that does not require a refrigerator or a freezer to preserve over time. And they're considered a real cultural delicacy. Uh, but in our everyday lives, these sorts of things are starting to appear. Again, in my lecture hall, I had a morning experience when a bunch of football players walked in after their weight workout and they were all munching on exo bars. And we chatted about how did they realize that these were actually made of cricket flour and not all of them had looked down at the ingredients lists in the package. They said, oh, these are actually pretty good. And this is the peanut butter and jelly flavored one, but this is made entirely of, of cricket flour protein. 
And that's basically just freeze dried pulverized crickets that are an extremely efficient way to get protein into many products. And a lot of us may be eating more insects in the future. I'll just give you one statistic to put this in relative perspective. In the United States, one pound of beef takes a thousand gallons of water and two acres of grazing land to produce. One pound of crickets takes one gallon of water and two cubic feet of space to produce. And you get about three times the protein, twice the iron, and far more nutrients in the crickets than you do out of the pound of beef. So someday we may see the backyard barbecue replaced with the insect factory. Uh, I'm skeptical of some of the sort of uh, silver bullet solutions to world food problems, but certainly insects will be playing a role as we look forward to a world with over 9 billion people by 2050. If you do a simple search on Amazon, you'll find tons of products that are made out of cricket flour. It's in everything. You've got cricket pasta, cricket brownies. Uh, I found, you know, cricket biscuits, cricket muffins. So just sometime take a look and search for cricket meal and you'll find upwards of 50, 60 different products being vended by over a dozen companies that are all basing their protein content on cricket flour. I want to end by saying a little something about pollination, which is the other chapter in the second half of my book. Insects are not Im only important to our understanding of the human genetic code and to the future of food, but also to the current food we're eating every day right now. Bees pollinate about 80% of the world's plants, including 90 different food crops, and one out of every three bites that you eat is thanks to bee pollinators. Uh, the honeybee is responsible for about $15 billion in U.S. agricultural crops each year. And if you look at that globally, the estimates range from half a trillion to a trillion dollars in annual agricultural products that are predicated on bee pollinators. I'm drinking coffee at the moment, as a matter of fact, and there'd be no coffee, no tea, and no chocolate without bee pollinators. So uh, I would be a pretty sad individual without those three things in my life. So we owe a lot to bees. I'll talk in the question and answer period a bit more about the threats that insects currently face. Some of you who follow the science news may have noted that last week, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences published a series of papers from a symposium that was titled Death by a Thousand Cuts, The Future of Insects, question mark, and upwards of 40% of insect species are in dramatic decline and a third of insect species are, are endangered at the moment. And so there's a real irony to all this because insects vastly outnumber us on the planet and some insects are likely to do well on a warmer planet as they're able to migrate to higher and higher elevations, new niches and new ecosystems, but many insects are also suffering. Now, finally, the good news is that people are starting to recognize the threats to insects and the important roles that they play in our lives. And so legislation and political activism to protect insect habitats, migratory corridors, reduce threats to insect populations is on the rise globally. So there is cause for hope, but we want to bear in mind some of these stories about the threats to our insect cousins. And on that note, I'll end with a thank you for the moment, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you so much. That was really interesting to see all the statistics and probably all the foods that we take for granted that we're not even thinking about and just different products in our daily life. Are, are the foods always, um, do they always kind of uh, mask it as something else? instead of saying shellac in food as well, an ingredient? The, the irony is we're all eating insects, whether we know it or not. For example, I'm, I'm drinking a cup of coffee, as I said, 10% of green coffee beans coming into the United States on average have ins are insect body parts. So you know, <laughs> if you drink your cup of morning joe, you're, you're consuming insects. So we're all sort of entomophagous by default. Insect body parts are in peanut butter, they're in chocolate. The FDA, in fact, allows portions of those in many, many major US food products. And so a lot of it doesn't even kind of need masking because it's just there by default. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then a lot of others like cochineal and, and shellac 
go by a whole variety of code names, I guess, because marketers think people will be grossed out if they actually tell you what you're eating. But for much of the world's population, eating insects is absolutely central to their diets. And so we in the West, in the United States and Europe, are, are in a vast minority globally in, 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 in shunning insects for the most part is a major part of our daily cuisine. <laughs> so you, you mentioned a bug that you did enjoy eating. Was there any that you tried that were not good? <laughs> yeah. Not so tasty? <laughs> I'll be I'll be honest. I've had bundungi, which is a South Korean delicacy. Those are those are roasted or boiled silkworm pupae, and I had those in Koreatown in San Francisco. You eat them in a styrofoam cup with a toothpick, and they're they're considered kind of wonderful street food. They taste like a cross between a shrimp and a peanut. <laughs> that taste, I think, just for me, I'd never you know I wasn't acclimatized to that. And so it was just an odd taste in my mouth that stayed with me a little too long. So I would put that a little lower down on, on my list as, as things I might not want to return to. But I've tried many of the products I've written about, in fact. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a couple of questions from our audience here. Christine asked, what was one of the most surprising things you learned from writing the book? Well, one of the most surprising things I learned uh, really were the stories of people like, like Marion and Turner. And I also profile Carl Fritsch, who was um, another pioneer of pollination science, but was mercilessly persecuted as a man of Jewish ancestry under the Nazis. And so one of the fascinating things was how many persecuted and, and beleaguered people were actually pioneers in the field. And my theory is that you don't need a lot to be a great entomologist. In other words, you can do great entomology in a lab with fancy equipment, but a lot of the real pioneers in the field were people who'd sort of been exiled from mainstream society and were doing things kind of on the margins, just out in the field, hunting around and coming up with elegant, simple experiments that revolutionized our thinking. And so as a kind of collective big surprise, those stories of marginalized people being so central to our understanding of these, these six-legged cousins that have also kind of been marginalized in our thinking about history was really, really remarkable. Okay, great. Um, Ashley asked, if you had to choose a favorite bug or which one you relate to the most, what insect would it be and why? Well, that's an easy one. It has become the silkworm for sure. And, and that, I have a little show and tell here, I must admit. Uh, it's because during the pandemic lockdown, my seven-year-old and I have been raising silkworms and I'll show you one of the cocoons. They made their cocoons a few weeks ago and this one has a little hole in it because the silkworm moth came out. We were making what we call a himsa silk. That's the Indian term for peace silk, where you actually let the moth emerge and, and, and do all of its thing. And then you take the rest of the cocoon. And my son and I have uh, very inelegant that we've done it on a toilet paper tube, but we've reeled. This is one cocoon's worth of silk thread. And all we did was we dipped the cocoon in boiling water and then pulled on it. And we ended up with this remarkably long, strong thread. And a friend of ours is going to sew this into a quilt for us, or at least make a quilt out of, out of whatever thread we can, we can provide for her. Um, and, and I just find, I just find silk moths remarkable because you get to see their lives passing in front of you in really rapid, at rapid speed. Uh, in four to six weeks, they grow 10,000 times their initial size from when they hatch out of an egg. And there are very few other organisms where you get to see that up close. And we put them in an aquarium with, with a clear glass box and we were watching them make their cocoons and it was just so enthralling to see this creature make a little hammock uh, among the sticks we'd put in there, spin itself into a cocoon, do its thing, metamorphosize, and then come out as a completely different entity. So I, I just think I'm so astounded at the moment by silkworms that I'd put them at the top of my list if I had to. <laughs> okay, Eileen asked, um, she said, we used to drive to New York City and the windshield was covered with dead bugs, not anymore. Can you speak about the collapse of the insect population that I have been hearing about? Yeah, so there are many facets to both that question and, and the answer to that. 
Um, you know, as I said, 40% of insect species are in decline and a third are endangered right now. And that has to do with a lot of factors. There's some big players on the list, of course, climate change is one, habitat destruction is another, you know, encroachment of, of cities into rural areas and, and the, the decay of migratory corridors for insects that migrate extremely long distances is something that's been in the media. For example, monarch butterflies often make journeys from the Canadian Rockies as far south as central Mexico. And the disruption of the places that are sort of their way stations along the way where they need to stop and feed has been has been part of the cause for their dramatic uh, population numbers declining. Now, in the case of bees, some of the causes are the same and then some are different. You may have read about colony collapse disorder, people who for their profession uh, run apiaries because so many American crops need to be pollinated by bees. You know, the big one is the California almond crop where, you know, trucks come in every fall with, with trillions of bees literally to pollinate billions of almond trees. It's America's seventh most important agricultural export. That's being caused, we think, by climate change and habitat destruction, but also by a class of chemicals called neonicotinoids that are chemicals that mimic nicotine, which you know of from tobacco, um, but seem to be really, really destructive to bee colonies. There's also a parasitic wasp with the fancy name Varora destructor um, that is a threat to bee colonies. So there are a number of causes for these things, but it seems like synthetic chemicals, climate change, habitat loss are the big ones. And so people are doing things at various levels to try and mitigate um, and turn back some of these problems. And this can be small stuff like planting pollinator gardens um, where you, you plant species on which these insects need to dine. Um, and there are lots of websites about how to plant pollinator gardens. Milkweed for monarchs is a really important source of food, but also a place where they lay their eggs on the underside of, of milkweed leaves. Um, planting pollinator gardens is part of many, many plans on campus. For example, at Amherst College, we're trying to get a pollinator garden going outside of our science center so that we can host some of these insects. Then at a larger scale, advocating for the political changes that need to happen to ban types of chemicals that are causing these problems or to work on larger scale issues like climate change and habitat destruction is also crucial. But you know, I would suggest that it's sort of a multi-tiered approach that we need to focus on to, to, to stem that tide. Um, Linda asks, what percentage of insects might be considered beneficial and what percentage are dangerous to humans? Yeah, I've seen statistics thrown about uh, that I've never quite verified that it's something like 0.1% of all insect species are detrimental to humans. And it's mostly, you know, a few types of mosquitoes. Um, Anopheles mosquitoes, which are carriers of malaria, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, carriers of, of yellow fever and dengue fever. And it actually is a relatively teeny number of the total insect population on the planet, whether you do it by numbers or by species or whatever, it's a teeny little fraction. And I've seen a bunch of different statistics thrown about um, with, with numbers like that, but they're all way far under 1%. And what I'm trying to do in this book, um, there've been you know a number of wonderful books written about all the awful things insects have done to us. I love John McNeil's book, Mosquito Empires, which is about how mosquitoes really con constrained European imperial expansion in the Atlantic world. Um, but I felt it was time to also look at the other side of the story and, and focus on the tremendously beneficial interactions that we've had and continue to have with our six-legged cousins. Um, so when, uh, Bill asked, can you speak a bit about beetles and why there are so many types of beetles? Yeah, yeah, so there are 350,000 species of beetles. And my favorite quote actually, probably my favorite quote about insects uh, has to do with beetles. There was a great uh, Indian born British entomologist named J.B.S. Haldane. And in the 1920s, he was sitting at a dinner table surrounded by theologians. And they asked him, Professor Haldane, uh, what do you know about the earth and the creator based on your studies of, of insects? And he said, well, he must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. 
uh, and and beetles beetles are just everywhere in part because uh, they're extremely durable creatures that are able to exist in so many ecosystems and so many microclimates. Uh, I've seen beetles in in travels all over the world, from Turkey to China to Sweden to to Chile, places that I've lived. Uh, beetles are able to exist um, uh, kind of at the margins where other creatures have tremendous trouble. They make their their living extracting water from dung and and living in underground burrows that would be completely uninhabitable to most other other beings on Earth. But they're they're extremely resourceful and resilient, and were a favorite topic of Charles Darwin. So if you want to read quite a bit about beetles, contact me and I can give you a recommended reading list. But it's really their adaptability uh, and their ability to live in so many niches where other creatures would, would not be able to find a home. Uh, Ed asks, are, there in, are the insect products you featured farms sustainably? Yeah, one of the intriguing things about them is most of them are quite sustainably produced. And, and it's partly because they're produced in much the same way that they have been produced for thousands of years. One of the things I highlight in the book is the importance of indigenous communities as the cultivators and bearers of the traditional econo ecological knowledge and the wisdom behind raising shellac, silk, and cochineal. Uh, in the case of cochineal, it's it's Mesoamerican peoples and, and now in Highland Peru. And in the case of shellac, it's, it's uh, indigenous people in, in India. And in, in the case of silk, um, the Chinese were the real pioneers. Um, and again, it's often people on the margins of society who, who hold the knowledge in these cases. And so most of the production of shellac, silk, and cochineal is, is, is very sustainable. Um, the types of trade networks that they're involved in may in many ways not be as sustainable because they're amalgamated with all sorts of other products that are produced in, in ways that, that may be detrimental to human health or ecosystem health. But for the most part, those, those three really are. And that's something I talk about quite extensively in the book. I hope I've, I've answered that adequately. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Scott asks, how do insects adapt over time to diminish the effectiveness of some insecticides? Yeah, that's a complica complicated question because it, it depends a lot on, on, the, on the species of insect. And, you know, I'm not an entomologist. I address that quite a bit in the book, though, that insects uh, have developed an array of very complicated evolutionary strategies for getting around all of the, the types of things that humans do to them. Often, though, it's their reproductive rates that allow them to maneuver around all, all of the different ways we try to eradicate them. They're reproducing so quickly that their ability to do sort of evolutionary leapfrogs, I'm using an amphibian as the metaphor for thinking about insects, which is a little odd, but are, is, 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 is partly a result of that rapid reproductive rate. Um, and so they're able to adjust very quickly because you know, the, the mutations are occurring much, much faster from generation to generation. Um, and, and so as a general fact, that might be the big answer to the question. Then it depends a lot um, from species to species. But it's something I talk about uh, in the book. Um, and so okay. feel free to read on if you want a more complicated answer. Um, Bill asks, how do insects navigate long distances? For example, the monarch butterfly's annual migration. Yeah, so, so there, there are a couple studies that have been coming out recently about how monarchs um, are able to navigate. And, and apparently, one of the things that's involved is their an antenna. And they do uh, heliocentric-based navigation that seems to be related to um, patterns in, in the location of the sun. And it's a tracking mechanism that people are studying in a field that I talk about a little in the book called biomimicry, where engineers have used insects as models for everything from space vehicles. There's a dragonfly program that NASA has been using to mimic uh, dragonfly anatomy in building spacecraft. And uh, the pioneers of GPS initially were looking into monarch butterflies and the way they're able to make this navigation. But it's it's a heliocentric navigation mechanism, people think, that's guided by, by sensors in the monarch's antenna. 
Um, and and what, what's still relatively poorly understood is the sort of intergenerational legacies of how navigation techniques are communicated among insects. But the, the papers coming out on this are some of the most fascinating ones in modern entomology. All right, we, we have a lot of questions, but we'll, we'll take two more. Um, and Dr. Malil, you said it was okay if we put your email address in the chat. If somebody is just dying to know the answer to their question, they can go ahead and email you at your email address at uh, Amherst. Absolutely, and okay. you know, I do. I do also have have fun suggestions for insect related things that people can do with their children during the pandemic. It's a little cold to be doing this one here, but in the fall, my son and I were trying this other one in addition to raising silkworms, which is that you can count a cricket's chirps for fourteen seconds, and then you add forty to that number, and you will get the ambient temperature in degrees Fahrenheit within one or two degrees, I can almost guarantee it. We tried it several times on the back porch and we have, <laughs> we have a thermometer and we, we almost nailed it. Twice we were within wow. one degree. So again, <laughs> count the crickets chirps for 14 seconds and, and then add 40 to that number if you're looking for something to do and you're in a place where it's warm enough that the crickets are still out. Um, crickets are ectomorphs like many insects. And so, so they slow way down when it gets cold and they speed up when it gets hot. And so the temperature is dramatically controlling the, 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 the frequency of their chirps. And there, there are a lot of fun things. And if people want recommendations or if you want advice on how to, how to raise silkworms at home, it can be done very inexpensively. And as we were talking about before this, this, this talk began, you can, you can, you don't have a lot of commitments that you have with other types of pets. So I'm happy, happy to provide people with, with uh, advice on doing that. Um, Janet asks, in nature, what would happen to a silk cocoon? Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing about Bombyx mori, which is the type of, of, of silkworm I'm talking about here, is it's a complete domesticate. It cannot exist absent of, of human influence. It's blind and flightless when the moth comes out. And uh, there are wild silkworms. They're called Bombyx mandarina. And, and still many people harvest them in the wild. Um, and cocoons, cocoons you know, over, over a long period decay. It's, it's kind of the consistency of styrofoam, though. This stuff is extremely durable once the cocoon is made. Um, but nothing like this exists in nature because the silkworm is, is far more of a domesticate than a dog is. It's completely dependent upon humans because of thousands and thousands of years of this cooperative interaction to produce silk for all of its food and, and the maintenance of its living conditions. Silkworms uh, silkworm larvae need temperatures between about 73 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So for example, we raised our, our silkworm caterpillars in a chicken incubator uh, where we could keep them warm enough and cozy enough, but without humans, they don't exist in, in nature. So it's, it's as complete a domesticate, uh, which suggests the Latin term domus, which is home. We're bringing the silkworm into our home. And in fact, in many traditional cultures, uh, in China, it was, it was very traditional to, to give the silkworms your bed and sleep on the floor when you're raising silkworms to keep them warm. Because if they're the source of your livelihood, if all of your money is coming from the silk you can produce, you want to do everything you can to keep those, those silkworms nice and cozy. And so there are these manuals from Imperial China that are amazing to read about tickling your silkworms with a chicken feather to make sure... <laughs> <laughs> they're awake at feeding time and how to feed them, when to feed them, what the temperature should be, you know, not to, not to smoke or eat any garlic nearby because the smells might disturb them. Um, but there, there is no such thing as wild bombix mori because, you know, they don't exist outside of human communities. All right, we'll wrap up with the last question here. Um, Jerry says, please talk about the environmental knowledge needed by the people who raise insects for profit. Yeah, so that that's another, you know, in addition to this whole argument about the synthetic age and, you know, the seeming disappearance of silk, shellac, and cochineal, and then their resurgence, the other big claim I'm making in the book is that indigenous peoples have been central to the long-term maintenance of the cultivation processes at work here. Um, and, and what's really interesting about it is it's both 
entomological, but it's also botanical. Uh, in all three cases, there's intimate knowledge of the types of plants that you have to raise as the habitats and food sources for the insects. So in the case of cochineal, it's a long-term understanding about raising nopal cacti. In the case of shellac, it's also a long-term understanding of raising fig and acacia trees. Um, and in, in, in the case of silk, it's a long-term understanding about raising Morris alba, the white mulberry tree. And in fact, at many times in history, when new upstarts tried to replicate these systems elsewhere without adequate knowledge or in the wrong environments, the results were disastrous. John Smith writes about attempts in the colony of Virginia to raise silkworms, and they were trying to do it on red mulberry trees. And it was probably too cold and the mulberries were the wrong kind of leaves and all the silkworms died and the colonists resorted to eating them and rats because they were so hungry they were eating their silkworms and eating rats because you know the the colony's economic uh, basis was in collapse and so the silkworms simply became food. Um, and in many of these cases this kind of pairing of botanical knowledge with entomological knowledge was deeply woven into traditional communities through oral traditions and in many cases written records as with, with Chinese records about sericulture that are passed from generation to generation as accumulated knowledge. And one of the fascinating things was kind of like a silkworm's thread, the continuity of these things is remarkable to today. Many of these, these tips and tricks have been preserved and they were radically misunderstood often by colonists. And I talk about some of these misunderstandings in the book. All right, well, thank you so much for your time this evening, Dr. Melillo and all of our patrons that joined us for our um, virtual author program tonight. Again, if you have any questions that you wanna ask the author directly, his email address is in the chat box. And um, don't forget if you're interested in buying a copy of the book, The Butterfly Effect, The Learned Owl has copies available for purchase um, on their website, which are uh, the link is also on the web chat there. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank it was you. a pleasure and your book sounds really fascinating. I'm, sh I'm sure we'll get many people asking for it at the uh, reference desk. <laughs> thank you so much, Allison. Thank, thank you, you have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you.